your seats. We'll begin just momentarily. Good morning. Good. Glad to see you here today. Uh, just a quick reminder, just some events coming up. Every Wednesday, we're having our family-friendly Wednesday worship and uh, enjoy a good time of fellowship, testimony, singing. And uh, we have different men preaching through the book of Titus. And uh, Rob Slayton did a great job last Sunday on the intro to Titus. And uh, this Wednesday, we have Drew, right? Uh, Drew Suheski who's going to preach uh, for, uh, for us this Wednesday night. So you pl make your plans to be here with us. We start at 6.30 and uh, always have a great, great time of worship and blessing. And we look forward to having you here. And then Friday is our uh, trip to Clintonwood Park uh, for whoever wants to come on out for a picnic. Every family brings their own picnic meal or something to eat. And uh, we meet between the tennis courts and the spray park. All right. There's some picnic tables provided, but if you want to bring some of your lawn chairs as well to relax in, they have tennis and pickleball and basketball and the swing sets and playground equipment. There is a spray park for a small fee if you want to do that. And if you want to bring cornhole or frisbee or whatever you want to do, just bring it. It's, it's casual and uh, we have a good time. We'll start about 5.30. I know that's a work day, and some of you might be getting home from work a little later, but join us uh, whenever you can. And uh, Clintonwood Park is on Clarkston Road uh, between Sashaba and Clarkston. Uh, M15, yes, it winds, so I had to think through. On Clarkston Road. All right, if you need directions, please see me or anyone else who knows where it is. All right, and then uh, two weeks from now, we'll have our Lord's Supper service at the 930 hour, and we look forward to that um, at the, on the 26th. Our missionary for today is Ken Dockery at uh, City View Church in Cleveland, Ohio. Ken was with us a few weeks ago when he brought the group uh, of students from Cleveland State. That was back in March, I think it was, or April? April and uh, met him so we want to pray for Ken and, and his ministry there today and then our sister church First Baptist of Goodrich Pastor Ben Gonzalez and uh, we want to remember them as our sister church in prayer today all right anything else I need to uh, remind us of or make note of all right good well we're going to begin our worship today with a, a worshipful song Ferris Lord Jesus and uh, recalls the different uh, characteristics of Jesus and how beautiful it is. It's poetic. Uh, it talks about the um, creation and the heavenly bodies, but Jesus shines purer. Jesus shines brighter than even those. And so it's just an admonition of, of how wonderful Jesus is. Let's stand to our feet as we begin our worship today.
Good morning. For our call to worship this morning, we'll be reading Psalm 100. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. For the Lord is good, his steadfast love endures forever, and his faithfulness to all generations. Let's pray. Dear Lord, uh, we are so grateful that your faithfulness endures to all generations, even to us. And uh, we thank you forever for being who you are, and uh, and we are just in awe of you. Lord, I thank you for the the sunshine and the uh, the nice weather. I thank you that we were all uh, able to gather here safely this morning and worship you. And uh, Lord, I pray for Ken Dockery and his ministry in Cleveland and City View Church. Um, We pray for perseverance as Cleveland can be a tough city to be in, and uh, we know that your hand is uh, over them and that you are guiding them. And uh, Lord, I pray for Pastor Ben Gonzalez in uh, First Baptist of Goodrich, uh, that you will be with uh, that congregation this morning, and uh, Pastor, as he will give that message to them and that they will carry it out. And uh, Lord, I pray for Pastor Tig and his message to us, that we will listen and that we will carry it out in our daily lives as well. Amen. All right, our Bible truths. Since we are redeemed by grace alone, through faith alone, where does this faith come from? Faith comes from the Holy Spirit. What do we believe about the Holy Spirit? That he is God, co-eternal with the Father and the Son. How does the Holy Spirit help us? The Holy Spirit convicts us of our sin, and he enables us to pray and to understand God's word. Well, there's a song that we're going to sing called There's a Fountain, but it was originally titled Praise for the Fountain Opened. And it's, uh, it's really rich and, and, and thoroughly scriptural. It uh, really presents a, a clear gospel truth about the saving power of Jesus Christ. One of the things that's... Uh, <clears throat> interesting with this song is that it in verse 2 it recounts the situation of the dying thief in verse 2 it says the dying thief rejoiced to see that fountain in his day you might think well what does it mean in his day that's not that's not like in in first century palestine that's that's talking about uh in the day of his shame and the day of his guilt and the day of his death He rejoiced to see that fountain that radically changed his life through joy and gave him life. So as we sing this song, let's praise for this fountain that's opened through Jesus Christ. No other way. Absolutely no other way. So let's stand and and rejoice over this truth as we think of this.
through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. Oh 
gather here on this first day of the week to remember that we are forgiven. And the price has been paid in full by the precious blood of Christ, that fountain and that flows so freely and is available to all who will believe. We're here to remember that we owe no more debt to our sin because you took it. And that we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone in Christ alone. How good it is to gather on this first day of the week to praise your name, to glorify you, to orient our mind and our thinking once again through corporate worship as we've done personally throughout the week. To be encouraged by the fellowship of brothers and sisters and the worship of our Savior. Lord, we rejoice to gather here on this first day of the week to remember the gospel by which we're saved and by which you have called us to proclaim. Lord, we're rejoicing to gather here on this first day of the week to remember that you rose from the dead, that death has no more dominion over you, and those that have faith in you will also rise from the dead. And as such, Lord, we're here to remember that no work for you is in vain. Our labor is not in vain in the Lord. So, Lord, we, we press on. We strive forward. Even though it may be tiring at times, we still press on in the grace that you provide, in the strength that you provide. And, Lord, we do it joyfully, knowing that our labor is not in vain in the Lord. So, Lord, we rejoice in gathering together as you have commanded us to do, to remember you, to remember our salvation, to remember your death, your blood, your resurrection, your kingship over our lives, your call to obedience, your call to share the gospel. And Lord, what a joy it is to serve you, our great King. Lord, receive our worship as we offer it today. May you be praised now and evermore. In Jesus' name. One of the thrilling aspects of reading through God's Word is, is seeing forever and ever the, the constant faithfulness of God. He has said He is going to do something, and then it actually happens. And we see this faithfulness of God happening time and time again. And not only that, God's Word delivers to us promise after promise. And so God's previous faithfulness gives us hope of the certainty of his continued faithfulness for future promises. One of the great responsibilities that we have with these promises from God's word is to pass them down, bear witness to the truthfulness of God. And so we're going to sing a song called Pass the Promise. And this is, this is not just a call of responsibility, but friends, this is a privilege that we get to do. We get to pass the promises from generation to generation of God's faithfulness, the truthfulness of his word, of what not only he's promised, but what Christ has achieved and what the Holy Spirit has actually wrought. So, uh, yeah, let's have fun with this song. <clears throat> I will pray rejoicing from my heart. Pray rejoicing from my heart. For in him my victory's lifted high. His salvation is my cry. He has overcome my enemy. Our praises scorn the enemy. I delight in his deliverance. The Lord is our deliverance. Pass the promise to our sons and daughters, God most high, God our Father, we bear witness. There is no one holy like the Lord. Our rock and refuge is our God. Do not speak with pride of no 
dismiss our children. Let's open our Bibles to Psalm 1 this morning, please. Psalm 1. All right, if you need a handout, go ahead and avail yourself of one of those now, if you have forgotten, and they're there for your, for your help if, if they help you. All right, Psalm 1. Last uh, Sunday, I had to think of when the last time I preached. Last Sunday, we uh, looked at the introduction to Psalms, and uh, there is a brief overview for you on the handout. We'll go through that really quickly in case you weren't here, but uh, the structure of the Psalms and what Psalms is all about is very helpful in several ways, and it will help us reading the book of Psalms if we know the, uh, some of the overview of it. First of all, we see that Psalms means the book of praises, or songs of praises from the Hebrew word telehim. The superscriptions above many of the Psalms are considered to be original, and they link that Psalm to an Old Testament story, and we can better understand that Psalm that's written in light of that Old Testament narrative, as that Psalm is a commentary, a color commentary uh, to that narrative. And uh, as we mentioned in last Sunday, the, the narrative is kind of like black and white, but the psalm gives the color to it, the emotion and the feeling and what's going on. And uh, so that's how we can understand many of the psalms. All in all, psalms is arranged into five books. And uh, again, it was considered that uh, perhaps this was collected. These different psalms existed throughout Israel's history, but then compiled at one time, all gathered and collected perhaps after the Babylonian captivity, maybe even by Ezra or Nehemiah, and they were arranged in a specific way. It wasn't just kind of randomly thrown together. So there is some structure and organization to the book. Book 5 ends with the Hallelujah Psalms, Praise the Lord. And then we see the conclusion of this, lets us know where the book is heading, and therefore we know its emphasis, Praise the Lord. Books 1 through 4 each end with a similar doxology having to do with praise the Lord, the Lord reigns forever, etc. So every book ends with praise the Lord. The whole psalm ends with five psalms that praise the Lord. Therefore, the theme of psalms is what? Praise the Lord. 
Book one, uh, mainly written by David, is David's ascent to the throne. These are general classifications, very general classifications, but it kind of helps us understand these particular books. David's ascent to the throne. Book two is David's reign, things that happened during his reign. Book three is by Asaph and the sons of Korah, and it traces the history from Solomon to the Babylonian exile. Book four, then, is chiefly anonymous, and it is a response to the Babylonian exile by pointing back to Moses. And as the Lord delivered Israel from Egypt under the time of Moses, they call upon God to deliver them from the Babylonian exile, and indeed God has done that, and they sing praises to him in response to that. The, a, a large part of book four is rejoicing that the Lord still reigns during exile and has always been faithful. And this is true to human experience, isn't it? That in our dark times, in our difficult times, one thing that helps motivate us to stay on the path is that God still reigns. He's still on his throne. So all, in all, book four serves to inspire hope that God will continue to be faithful and he will save Israel from the Babylonian exile. And then when we get to book five, it anticipates a new David, which is whom? Messiah, who will conquer and reign forever. And again, that harkens back to the Davidic covenant in 2 Samuel 7. God's promise to David that there would always be someone to sit on his throne, brings David into the messianic line and foretells the Messiah's coming to rule and reign forever. Psalm 110 one through, uh, talks about David's, uh, the new David will rise to crush the head of his enemies, and then again, that harkens back to the promise of Messiah in Genesis 3.15. And then we have the Hallelujah Psalms. God's people respond to the triumphal king, Messiah, who's come to save his people, to crush his enemies. And what's the response of God's people? Praise the Lord. So in all, when we look at that, the summary of the Psalter is that the storyline of the Psalms is the storyline of the Bible. Right? We're looking for an end, and we're going through this journey in life, through adversity, through difficulty, through exile. But God has always been faithful, and he's going to and has sent his son, Messiah, and we anticipate his coming, and for God to be faithful and to save us, and for the king to come and rule and reign and crush the head of his serpents and deliver us from the bondage of sin in this world. Amen? So we see the sim the, uh, a similar the same melodic line, redemptive themes in the Psalter as we do in the whole Bible. Through the sin of forsaking God, man is banished from God into exile. I guess I'm just repeating myself now. But God is faithful to remember his people. God will send his king Messiah to deliver and save his people. The response of this salvation by God's people is a chorus of praise the Lord, God's glory through judgment and salvation are at the center uh, of the theology of Psalms. Okay? All that was a review from last week. Okay? So it's there in your handout. I just gave it to you in a brief moment. And if you want to know more, watch last week's uh, live stream video. All right? But that will help us understand where the Psalms are headed and what's going on in the big picture of the Psalms. Now, when we get to uh, Psalm 1 and 2, really, we see that these two uh, psalms are really a preface. They serve as a preface to the psalm. Now, if you get a book, you generally see a preface at the very beginning. What is the function of a preface to a book? Kind of lets you know what the book's going to be about, right? And that's really what we have in Psalm 1 and 2. These psalms basically are anonymous. We don't really know who wrote them, perhaps David, perhaps even Solomon, but uh, they really capture the theme that we're going to see throughout the rest of the psalms. In Psalm 1, we see the two paths that people can take, the way of the righteous and the wicked. And again, this agrees with the whole of Scripture. Those that honor God are blessed, and those who dishonor God will face judgment. And then Psalm 2 will talk about the coming of the Messiah, the, this king who will reign forever. And so we'll talk about those each in succession. 
Psalm 1 begins describing the man as what? First word of Psalm 1, blessed is the man. Okay? And we see that that connects in chapter 2. Look at verse 12 of chapter 2. Kiss the son lest he be angry with you and you perish in the way for his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. So we see the promise of blessing for the man who trusts in God's word and who awaits the king. And when we put it all together, this is really the theme of the book of Psalms, the Psalter, we'll call it, the hymn book. Psalm 1 and 2 introduce the Psalms as a prayer book for God's people who are striving faithfully to obey Torah, the Pentateuch, the Old Testament, the book of the law. So they're striving to obey God's word while they are looking for the Messianic king. Psalm 1 and 2 uh, give us that dynamic as we go into the rest of the psalm. Again, this is really helpful. Let me read it to us again. Psalm 1 and 2 introduce the psalms as a prayer book for God's people who are striving to faithfully obey the Torah. That's Psalm 1. And then Psalm 2, while we look for and anticipate the, the Messianic King. Now, as we go into the book of Psalms, we want to begin with a question. Just hang on to this. You don't have to answer out loud. Please don't. But what is one thing that you love to do? What is one thing you love to have or one thing that you love to be? Just think about it. It's a simple question, right? As we're sitting down to coffee, hey, man, tell me about yourself. What's, what, what turns your crank, man? What do, you, what do you love? What do you like to do? What's your passion in life? So you thinking about that? How many have an answer? All right, hold on to that answer. We'll come back to it, all right? Now, when we approach Psalm 1, we see that it is classified as wisdom literature, the first psalm. It teaches us how to live, how? Wisely. Did we just get through a whole series of wisdom literature in Ecclesiastes? Right. What is the, the life under the sun? All is vanity. Therefore, what's the white way to live wisely? The conclusion of the matter is to do what? Fear God and keep his commandments. Wisdom literature teaches us how to live. And really, you'll see some of that language here in Psalm 1, which is why some believe that Solomon could have possibly authored Psalm 1. We'll see some Solomonic uh, themes and, and overtones here in the first Psalm. Many of us Americans may recall Robert Frost's poem, The Road Not Taken. How many recognize that from literature class back in high school? Okay. Two roads diverged in a yellow wood, and I took the one less traveled, and that has made all the difference. Okay? Now, that is just a human example. Robert Frost was not inspired by God to write that. But it just talks about two roads that he chose. He's at a crossroads in life. He has to choose one or the other. And there's many different interpretations as to what Frost meant by that poem, and I'll leave that out there for the liter literature teachers to discuss. But it does have a, a I'll add some, a spiritual component to it in the fact that Psalm 1 is similar. There's two paths that people can take uh, for our life. And uh, Frost said he, took, he chose one, and that has made all the difference. Now, what Frost meant by that is, might be something different than what I think we can mean from it. We are faced as human beings with choosing a way of life, aren't we? And we can choose the path less traveled, which Jesus mentioned is the straight and narrow gate. Or there's a wide gate that leads where? To destruction. Okay? I'm spiritualizing frost again, but um, that'll make all the difference. Now, as part of his poem, notice the title of the poem, The Road Not Taken. It's not the road less traveled. So by nature then, if to choose one road, whether it's the wide and narrow or the straight, I'm sorry, the wide gate, uh, path versus the straight and narrow gate, by choosing one, what are you doing with the other? 
you're denouncing the other, the road not taken. So we will either choose the righteous path, as Psalm 1 lays out, or we can choose the way of the wicked, the path of the wicked. But by choosing one, you have to denounce another. So make your choice in life wisely. Psalm 1 captures then the main subject of all the psalms, again, as it's serving as a preface. It captures the main emphasis of the psalms. You have all the scriptures by defining these two paths. Spurgeon says in his Treasury of David, it is, this psalmist, it is the psalmist's desire to teach us the way to blessedness and to warn us of the sure destruction of sinners. This, then, is the matter of the first psalm, which may be looked upon in some respects as the text upon which the whole of the psalms make up a divine sermon. So Spurgeon says this Psalm 1 is given to teach us the way of blessedness, to warn us against the way of sinners. So let's read Psalm 1 together. And uh, Oh, wait. I do want to do one more thing. There is a parallelism in Psalm. I mentioned this before we read it so that you can be looking for it once we do. Now, in the parallelism, it's a parallel, they are parallels of contrast. Contrasting the righteous with the wicked. And you'll see these, many of us are perhaps familiar with the Psalm already. But the righteous is blessed, meaning happy or fulfilled. The opposite of the wicked man would be what? is that he perishes in verse 6. The, wise, uh, the righteous man is blessed, but the wicked perish. The righteous man delights in God's word, but the unrighteous, the wicked man, does not delight in God's word. The righteous man is like a well-watered tree, but the wicked are like dry chaff. So it's not just tree and chaff, but well watered and dry as well. The righteous man is firmly planted by rivers of water, but the unrighteous are driven away by the wind. You've got stability versus instability. The wise man, the righteous man, I'm sorry, produces fruit while the wicked is fruitless and useless, which is chaff. Chaff is useless. You can't eat it. And then the righteous man does not stand in the company of the wicked, verse 1. And at the end of verse 6, we see that the, the wicked does not stand in the congregation of the righteous. So it shows fellowship. So you see the contrasts between these two paths. And this is very helpful to see what the author here is doing, how he has structured the psalm to show us the two paths. Are you ready to read the first psalm? All right, you'll see these in it as we read. Here we go. Psalm 1-1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season. Its leaf does not wither, and all that he does, he prospers. Comes the contrast. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Let us pray. Lord, once again we come to you with hungry hearts desiring to hear from you through your word that you have revealed. And Lord, may our hearts and minds be settled, focused on receiving your word. God, we just ask that you would teach us what we don't know. Give us what we don't have. Make of us what we are not. We are totally dependent on you. Be with your servant as I 
proclaim the truth, may it be the truth of God's word as you give utterance. And may our hearts respond in obedience and faithfulness, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the first thing that we see is the characteristic of the righteous man. What is, what is his characteristic? How is he described? What are his uh, habits? And first of all, we see in Psalm 1, 1, that blessed is the man. Okay, so he is blessed. Literally, blessings to the man. God will give his blessings to the man who lives accordingly to this righteous lifestyle. The Holman Christian Standard Bible says, How happy is the man who does these things. The New American Standard says, How blessed is the man who does these things. So blessed is the man. And we see again in Psalm 2.12, which we read already, Blessed is the man who will take refuge in him. And then Psalm uh, 112, I have it here, give me a minute. Praise the Lord, blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who greatly delights in his commandments. Psalm 144, 15, blessed are the people to whom such blessings fall. Blessed are the people whose God is the Lord. So we see the blessings are pronounced to the man who fears God, to the man who takes refuge in God, to the man who delights in his commandments. Blessings to the people whose God is the Lord. Happy is the man. Blessings to the man whose God is the Lord. And of course, this goes back to our created purpose. Again, as we just have come off of the, the book of Ecclesiastes, what is the whole purpose of life? Fear God and keep His commandments. All else is vanity. The only way that you are going to be happy, the only way that you're going to be fulfilled, is to seek God. Why is this man blessed by God, or blessings to the man? Because he doesn't walk in the counsel of the wicked word counsel means advice. He doesn't take the advice of those who don't know God because those who don't know God don't know the wisdom of God. Therefore, their advice is not wisdom, but what? So what's the opposite of wisdom? Foolishness. So he does not adopt the world view, or you could say philosophy of the wicked. He doesn't live according to their philosophy or their world view. He doesn't adapt that and live accordingly. He doesn't participate in their plans or their projects. He doesn't go along with their counsel. He doesn't take their advice. He, he's not mentally controlled by the wicked. Now, do, 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 I'm sorry. Do the wicked have a loud voice in our world today. <laughs> yeah, they have a big platform. They talk loudly and through many avenues, through social media, through news media, through music, through film, through the lifestyle that they live. But the righteous man doesn't listen to that advice. He doesn't adapt that philosophy we have to be careful what we allow to influence our minds because as a man thinks in his heart what so is he whatever you allow to be an influence in your life will develop your thinking how you think will develop your uh, worldview and your philosophy of life your philosophy of life will then determine how you live it all starts with what you allow to influence you. Determines your thinking, determines your lifestyle. Don't adopt, don't listen to, be careful. Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life, Proverbs 4.23 says. Be very, very careful what you allow to influence your thinking. It will develop your lifestyle. A godly man doesn't walk in the counsel of the wicked. Nor does he stand 
in the way of sinners. Meaning he does not participate in their lifestyle. He doesn't follow the same immoral path. He doesn't stand in their company. He doesn't participate. He doesn't live with them. He doesn't do their activities. He doesn't be, he's not involved in what sinners do. He does not sit in the seat of the scornful. Now, when you look at that word sit, that will involve the concept of fellowship. He's, he's sitting down amongst them. He does not fellowship with those who scoff. That's what the word scoffers are. They scorn, they criticize, they ridicule God. They ridicule the Word of God. They ridicule the worship of God. They ridicule God's people. Hey, if you allow yourself to sit in the company of that influence, guess what your thinking will become? God is not mocked. <laughs> Don't allow yourself to be influenced by those who scoff. Rather, we should influence them with the gospel. We should be a positive influence there. So we see the characteristic of this godly man. And notice the digression of movement here. This is an example that's widely given when we teach on this psalm. The man is walking down the path of life. And all of a sudden as he walks, he says, oh, I'm walking not in the counsel of the ungodly, but let's just do the opposite. He's walking down the path of life, and he sees the counsel of the ungodly. God. He starts, starts to think about it. And then he stands there and, and looks, peers in, wonders what they're talking about. He gets a little closer, and then all of a sudden it looks interesting, and then he, he sits down in the seat of the scoff. There's a digression. You're walking, and then you stand, and then all of a sudden you sit. There's a warning there into how we live life and how we are to approach the, the wicked. Proverbs says that the, the wise man sees the evil and he passes by it. Now, of course, that means adopting the worldview, participating in the lifestyle, doing the activities. But, of course, we do have interaction with the sinful we work with them, we, with the, those who are not saved. We have to give them the gospel. So it's not a complete avoidance of their company. It's an avoidance of their lifestyle and their uh, worldview. Am I making sense? So we're not to sequester ourselves in, in a monastery to live a godly life. That's not what he is saying. He's just saying don't adopt their philosophy or their way of life. And the man that does that is blessed. Not only do we see the characteristics of the righteous man, but we also see the customs of the righteous man in verse 2. Look at it. His delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. Okay, these, this shows his habits, his customs. First of all, we see that uh, the word but... His delight is in the Lord. What do we know by that conjunction but? Sets up a contrast, right? He doesn't do what sinners do. He's not involved in their fellowship or the worldview. But, on the other hand, this is what he does. He lives in contrast. He delights in God's law. He delights in God's law. And that word delight means to take joy. In, to take pleasure in the Word of God, in seeking the Word of God, in obeying the Word of God, in knowing God better through His Word. He takes joy in the Word. Not merely does referring to the law of Moses, but in the law of God. His delight is in the law of the Lord, all of God's ways. Not just the letter of the law, but the spirit. The whole relational aspect of, of knowing God, of living with God, of communing with God through God's word and through prayer and through worship. Psalm 119 gives several more indicators 
that talk about this man delight in the Word of God. And Psalm 119 is a, uh, an exaltation of the Word of God, the, the Torah. 119, verse 16, I will delight in your statutes. I will not forget your Word. Verse 47, I find del my delight in your commandments, which I love. Verse 77, let your mercy be Come to me that I may live, for your law is my what? My delight, my joy. Now let's go back to the question we asked at the beginning. Remember that you put in the back of your brain? Okay, now bring that back. What is one thing you love to do, love to have, love to be? Whatever that is, let's compare that to the kind of passion that we have towards God and His Word. Do I, the thing that I named, that I'm passionate about, that makes me tick, that I just love to do, love to have, am I that passionate for God and His Word? Whether it's coffee in the morning, <laughs> you wake up and think, oh man, I just can't wait to get that coffee. Or whatever it is, silly illustration. Do you, do you long to be with God in His Word? Here's a simple test. What's the first thing you think of in the morning? What's the first thing that you approach and get into in the morning? Social media? Television? News? Snooze? <laughs> what is the first thing you pursue? Other than taking care of yourself, what's, what's the first thing you do? Let me encourage us. Pursue God's Word first thing in the morning. Pursue your relationship with God first thing in the morning. Set that up as a first fruits of your offering of your day to God. Before you turn on social media, talk about vanity of vanities, right? Let us pursue God. So whatever is nat our natural bent is towards the things that we like, just ask yourself the question, do I pursue God's Word with that kind of passion? And if not, you can develop that habit. You can change. You can grow. You can improve towards God and His Word. So not only does he delight in God's Word, but he meditates in God's law. He meditates on God's law. That word meditate means to muse or to think upon. And not just think of it once, but to mutter over and over to oneself the word of God, the law of God, to, to rehearse, to mutter. Oftentimes I spend my days alone. I'm not having a pity party, but I often talk to myself, right? Right? I, probably because I'm the only one who listened to me. To me. But I, I find myself just talking to myself. And then when my wife comes home, she says, why are you, why are you making all those noises and saying all this? Because that's just what I do. I'm used to it. But I, to mutter things. And, and, and the challenge for us is, the, the, the teaching, the instruction is, do I mutter the word of God? Just, you know, you know blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of God, who stands in the way of sinners. As we pray, as, as, as I walk my dog Jackson, to, I try to utter the word of God as, through prayer and meditation and uh, to try to invoke these realities into my own life. And just a constant rehearsal of the word of God in our minds to meditate, to mutter, to muse upon these things. Some have given the example of a cow chewing its cud all right? Uh, if you know anything about bovine uh, anatomy, a cow has four stomachs and it chews it, grazes and chews its grass, swallows it down, and then lovingly regurgitates it to chew it again, to digest it better, and then it swallows it, and then brings it up again to chew it some more and digest it. So it's a constant bringing back up again to chew on it some more, to digest it, to ingest it better. It's one example that has been given in regards to what it means to meditate on God's law. You, you bring it in. Again, 
you're having the influence, not of the world and its philosophy, but of God and His Word influencing my mind and then musing on it, muttering it over again, bringing it back up. Now, if that's what's influencing your mind, what kind of life are you and I going to live? We'll tend to live more of a godly life. Now, he meditates on it day and night. This shows us the frequency of rehearsing God's word to oneself. The frequency. And this is not just a checklist. There, I did my devotions in the morning. Boop, there, I'm done. But this is a continual rehearsing, the frequency of meditating on God's Word. We're in Psalm 1. Turn over to chapter 5 real quickly, verse 2. You'll see another reference in this regard. Uh, 5, one. Give ear to my words, O Lord, consider my groanings. Then verse 2. Give attention to the sound of my cry, my King and my God, for to you do I pray. O Lord, in the morning you hear my voice. In the morning I prepare a sacrifice for you and watch. And then we go to Psalm 55. It's a small book. Let's turn over there and let's look at that. we got some time. Go to Psalm 55. Look at verses, uh, verse 17. Psalm 55, 17. Evening and morning and at noon I utter my complaint and moan and he hears my voice. The emphasis is there, evening and morning. And this, of course, is a lament psalm in that particular case. And then the other verses there, 88, 13, and the other verses listed there, shows the repetition, the frequency of praying to God, morning and at night, musing, meditating on God and His Word. Now in the New Testament, if, if morning and evening sounds like a, a pretty busy schedule, what does the New Testament tell us to do? Pray without ceasing. I think really that's the idea. As we muse and mutter and think, it's not just one time in the morning, one in the evening. It's a continual relationship with God. Morning through evening. This verse establishes a melody throughout the Psalter of meditating on God's Word. And uh, we see some other references there. Remember, Psalm 1 is a preface to the book, and so we see... Not only this prayers of daily, day and evening, but also meditating. We see that mentioned throughout the Psalms as well. On a side note, there, if if you want some help, I know a good book is uh, a devotional is Spurgeon's Morning and Evening. That's really good. You can get that on Amazon. I think fairly cheaply. Spurgeon's Morning and Evening Devotions. Uh, Oswald Chambers, My Utmost for His Highest, is a, is a good devotional. Now, of course, as always, you know this, these don't substitute the reading of God's Word. These are aids, tools, helps. But we must be in God's Word. But if you want some help, those are, are very uh, encouraging, challenging uh, tools that we can use that may help you. Now, as we talk about musing and meditating on God's Word day and night, and man who doesn't to walk in the counsel of the wicked, can you name one spiritual giant or one spiritual hero who has not dedicated themselves to God's Word? <laughs> what makes a man great? God does. And that man's obedience to his God, that man's submission to the Word of God. No one will ever become a great godly person without dedicating himself to God and His Word. And the good news is, who are the only ones that can be good godly people? Every believer can be a godly person. You just have to work at it. You just have to make up your mind. 
you just have to recognize the counsel of the ungodly and don't sit in the seat of the scornful, and you need to meditate and delight yourself in God and His Word. Guess what? As you meditate on God's Word, your thinking determines your way of life. You will become godly because the Word of God is influencing you. By way of application, do I delight to spend time with God and His Word? These are not in your handout. These are, these are freebies. Do I merely skim over the Bible, or do I really read it? Study it. Do I meditate on it? How much of my day and night are spent in Scripture versus spent in vanity? Some thoughts to challenge our thinking. And for our last point this morning, let's look at the, not only the characteristics of the godly man, the customs of the godly man, but let's look at the consequences then for the godly man. Because he doesn't do what sinners do, but rather delights himself in God's law, what is the outcome of that lifestyle? Look at verse 3. He is like a tree planted by streams of water, that yields its fruit in its season. Its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. First of all, we see that he's like a tree planted by streams of water. It's been customary to plant fruit trees near irrigation channels so that the tree is healthy, produces vibrant fruit. Passages in in the Bible reference that uh, practice. Obviously, If you're planting a summer garden, it needs water, doesn't it? Fortunately, this week, your garden got plenty of water. (laughs) But without water, your, your garden doesn't grow well. But these are trees that are intentionally planted by streams of water so that these trees produce vibrant fruit. He is planted. By that, we see that he is firmly rooted as his roots reach for the life-giving water. Of course, water is symbolic of God's word, God's law. And he's, as his root system spans out through the dirt to reach that water, his root system is strong and firmly embeds him into the ground. And therefore, he's not easily shaken. He is not easily shaken. Loved ones, when we plant ourselves in God and on His Word, we are on firm ground. Amen? The Word of God is a solid anchor. It's a solid rock. You can build your life on the rock. And when the rains came down and the floods came up, your house on the rock stands firm. Amen? He's not easily shaken. He's like a tree that's firmly planted. He saturates himself with God's Word. He's so close to the water that he just sucks it up and soaks it in. He yields fruit in its season. Not only is he firmly planted, but it's fruit. He bears fruit. What does fruit on a tree show? Well, it shows that the tree is alive, right? One of the indicators of a dead tree is that there's no fruit growing on it. But a tree that is alive has fruit. Fruit fulfills the tree's purpose. In nature, a tree wants to reproduce. It's God's way. It's like God told us to be fruitful and multiply. The trees follow the same command. We were just walking. Emmanuel was at the house yesterday. And uh, we were walking by, and I saw a little oak tree that had grown, and we pulled out and saw that the the bottom was an acorn, right? Of course, I live on two-thirds of an acre with 25 oak trees. We see a lot of those all the time, but I was pointing that out, Emmanuel. But a tree that bears fruit is fulfilling its purpose. One day, that tree will die. But if it has cast off other fruit and produced new life, it is fulfilling its purpose, right? And just as we believers are in Christ, we are drawing from the water of God's Word. We are to produce fruit. That 
fruit shows that we are alive spiritually. As we are alive spiritually, that's why we're, we were created. That fulfills our purpose. We're to produce new life through evangelism and through discipleship so that when we die, the Word of God carries on in the next generation. Its leaf does not wither. He is sustained by the water, but also his leaf reaches out for the nourishment of the sun. Reaches out for the nourishment of the sun. And it acts, enacts photosynthesis. His leaf endures throughout the various seasons. His leaf does not wither. And I'm always amazed that here in Michigan, the, the four seasons that we have, it's interesting to me to see the cycle of nature, and particularly living in the woods, I see this in, in, our, in our trees. Right now we're experiencing the beautiful growth. Everything's green and bright, right? Last that way until the fall comes and they change color, which is beautiful. My favorite time of the year. But then the leaves fall off. But the spring, it doesn't mean the tree's dead. It just means it's a cycle of nature. And how do we know the tree is, life? The tree is still alive? Because in the spring it bursts forth again. It endures all the seasons. Even as cold and snowy as it gets here, that tree's still alive. It produces fruit, produces leaves. We contrast this with Isaiah's warning to the wicked in Isaiah 1. Isaiah says regarding the wicked, we see the contrast. But rebels and sinners shall be broken together, and those who forsake the Lord shall be consumed. For you shall be like an oak whose leaf withers, and like a garden without water. Another contrast. Isaiah pulls out this same uh, metaphor of the tree being dead and unwatered and dying because they are wicked and they don't know God. And in all that he does, he prospers. I'm not turning into Joel Olstein now because what we're seeing is that this is spiritual health, wealth, and prosperity. Not material. Not material. This is spiritual health. Spiritual wealth. Everything he does prospers. Now, God can materially bless a righteous man, but he's not obligated to. But when God does bless us, what are we to do with the gifts that God blesses us with? To rejoice in them. This echoes Solomon's teaching in Ecclesiastes of rejoice with contentment. You recall Ecclesiastes of 11. Rejoice in the days of your youth. For it is good to be born. Light is sweet and it's good for the eyes to see the sun. Rejoice in your youth. Ecclesiastes 9. Rejoice with the wife of your youth. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. So these good gifts that God's given us, we enjoy life with as God's gifts, but we don't turn them into God's and start worshiping our work. Start worshiping our pleasure. Start worshiping the pursuit of knowledge. But we take what God's given us and we rejoice in those days. All that He does prospers. Prospers with content. Knowing that God is our God. Knowing that we are firmly planted trees by rivers of water that bears fruit, that, that leaf endures, it can withstand all the tempests of this life. That is blessedness. Amen? That is blessedness. It's a spiritual life, spiritual endure, endurance. These blessings fulfill then the promises of verse 1. Blessings to the man who doesn't do what sinners do, who meditates in God's Word. Therefore, the consequences, the blessings of not doing what sinners do and meditating in God's Word and delighting in God's Word, he's like a firmly planted tree that bears fruit and doesn't wither. This teaches us that to find purpose and fulfillment in life, we must fear God and keep His commandments. 
Does that sound like Solomon? Which is, again, gives some credibility to the possibility that Solomon wrote this one. But we don't say that with certainty. Blessed is the man, recalls God's words to Joshua. You remember Joshua 1 9 or 1 8? God is commanding Joshua to go in and take the land. He says, This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it. Guess how often? Day and night. And you may be careful to do what is commanded, for then you shall make your way prosperous, and then you shall have good success. So this Psalm 1 really just reiterates, is a preface to all the Psalms, but really connects to the whole theme of Scripture, that the righteous man who meditates in the Word of God and does it will be successful and prosperous in life. Now, in conclusion, we see that becoming blessed by God or blessed by God is not as easy as choosing door number one, right? How many remember, let's make a deal, right? Door number one, door number two, or door number three? We'll take door number two. Okay, okay, you get what's meant. Well, it's not that easy. You can't just say, well, since there's two paths, one is blessed and the other one perishes, the one's like a tree and one's like chaff. Oh, I'll just take the good one. It's not that easy. What's required? Effort. Diligence. Discipline. Striving. Pursuit. The cares of this world will want to choke out your desire to meditate on God's Word and to spend time with God and to be godly. Won't they? The allurements and attachments and shiny things of this world will draw us away. So it takes effort to be this kind of person, to walk this path. Psalm 1 points to the only perfect man. Who is the most blessed man who has all meditated in God's Word and followed it perfectly? Jesus Christ. And so even in Psalm 1, we have an anticipation of Jesus Christ fulfilling this individual's plight. Uh, yeah, the reference, Luke, 20, uh, Luke 24, 44, remember Jesus after his resurrection, walking with the disciples on the road to Emmaus. Jesus says to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Jesus is the perfect righteous man. Now the only way you and I can be perfectly righteous is then through Christ. Right? You and I can't attain righteousness on our own. But we can attain righteousness as it is imputed to to us, as, as Christ's righteousness is imputed, credited to our account. Romans 5.19, For as by one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, talk about Adam, so by the one man Christ's obedience many will be made righteous. Philippians 3.9, Being found in Christ, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God, that depends on faith. So Christ is the only true, truly perfect righteous man, and the only way I can become a perfectly righteous man is through Christ and His imputed righteousness to me. As we strive to obey Him and bear fruit, Christ strengthens us by giving us His nature so that we can grow in righteousness. Turn to 2 Peter 1. As we close, and again, because Christ is the fulfillment, I'm not just taking a random verse. I think this Psalm 1 predicts the coming of Christ. Christ is our righteousness. But let's look at as we meditate on God's Word, as we resist sin, as we delight in God and His Word, 
in, as we are in Christ and his, his nature becomes ours, look what the promise is in 2 Peter 1.3. We'll read through verse 11. 2 Peter 1, 3, His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who called us to His glory and excellence. So what has God given us that pertain to life and godliness? All things. Verse 4, By which He has granted to us His precious and very great promises so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. So how can you and I not walk, stand, or sit with the sinful? By taking on the nature of Christ, which He has made available to us if we but take His promises and live this way, if we take this path. Verse 5, for this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith. King James says, add it to your faith. Virtue, and I'll skip ahead. Virtue, add knowledge, add self-control, add steadfastness. Verse 7, add godliness, brotherly affection, and love. Now look up here. As we're adding these characteristics to our faith, that takes effort, right? Right? Knowledge, virtue, knowledge, self-control, brotherly love. That takes effort. And how's the only way we can do that? Through whose nature? Christ's nature in me. That God has given me. And look at the promise then in verse 8. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or what? Unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Christ. You want to be like a man who's like a tree planted by rivers of water that brings forth fruit? Trust in Christ. Take on His nature. With every effort, add to your faith and you will not be unfruitful in the work of God. Verse 10. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election, for if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. For in this way, there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Hey, amen! <laughs> Where does this road of righteousness, this path that we can choose, where does it end? ends as an entrance to the kingdom of God. Along the way, we must be diligent. We must make every effort to delight in God's Word, to meditate in God's Word, to add to our faith, to take on His nature, to realize that strength only comes from Christ. So, there are two paths that you and I can take. We've talked about the righteous path and we've seen where it ends. Next week we'll look at the unrighteous path and where it ends. You say, well, Pastor Tig, we, you know, we're all here in church. We, we've chosen the right path. Praise the Lord. But we all need reminders, don't we? We all need strength. We all need edification. I'm not teaching you something brand new. I'm just reiterating the truth to encourage your hearts to stay on the path. Now, if you are here and you've not chosen the path that leads to righteousness, the path that leads to fruitful living for Christ, you can find that only in the, right, the only righteous person, Jesus Christ. And be made righteous through Him alone. Let me encourage you to do that today, and if you have any questions, i certainly be happy to talk to you about them. Let's pray. Lord, strengthen us today with your word. Lord, as we consider our life, recognize that it can take two directions. May we choose the path of righteousness. 
And in so doing, it is a path that has effort, that takes effort. Lord, it is a path that is full of blessedness that leads to your eternal kingdom. So, Lord, just implant your word in our hearts. Encourage us to do right. Encourage us to forsake unrighteousness, not adopt the philosophy of the world, not participate in its lifestyle, or to sit in the fellowship of the world, the, 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 of the wicked, the ungodly. But Lord, may instead we delight in the word of God. May we meditate, may we mutter it to ourselves morning, evening, and at night. Morning, noon, and evening. Lord, I just ask that you would, again, be glorified in the life that you've given us so that we can be good testimonies of the Word of God as we live it out. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Good. Anybody have any comment or question or something that you learned, were encouraged by, something take away with you today. I'll take a drink from my chalice of victory while you think about it. Anybody? Yes, Brother Terry. Amen. Amen. Good. And I'll uh, tie all that together when we get through someone. But he's, he's absolutely right. The, the blessed man of Psalm 1 is the, the Messiah of Psalm 2. It's through him. Thank you, Terry. Good. Uh, Randy. Right. Yeah, it's a constant, it's progressive sanctification, right? The word we use. It's constant growth, increasing. Good, thank you. All right, anyone else like to share a word? All right, Adam, you up to playing us, uh, accompanying our next song? All right, we're going to sing, We Will Proclaim. And as we've heard the good word today, and uh, challenged through other songs and through our scripture today, uh, we will proclaim everything that we've seen and we've heard. All right? Let's stand together and we'll close by singing this song.
ask or think according to the power at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. <laughs>